Welcome to the IAM Overview and Policies section. In this section, we're going to have a look at IAM and provide an overview of what it is and what it's used for. Then we're going to take a look at IAM policies. And finally, we'll do a demonstration of how to create an IAM policy in AWS. So, what is IAM? Well, Identity and Access Management is the service that enables you to securely control user access to all your AWS services and resources. It's based around the concept of user management that you'll already be familiar with, users, groups, and permissions. So here we're just gonna go through the key features of IAM and then we'll cover each of them in more depth. So the first thing is it gives you shared access to your account. It provides granular permissions. It gives secure access to AWS resources. It can provide identity federation and if you're not sure what that is, we'll cover that. Identity information for assurance, which is crucial these days with all the auditing that goes on. It's PCI DSS compliant. It allows you to set up a password policy and also multi-factor authentication. So let's take a look at each of these in detail. Now, IAM provides shared access to your account which allows you to grant other people in your organization permission to administer and use AWS resources in your account without you having to share your password or access key. Now, when you set up your AWS account for the first time, you give an email address and a password, and this is effectively your root account. So you obviously don't want to be sharing this with people, but as an admin user, you can use IAM to share access. So for example, here's a bunch of users, they need access to EC2 and S3, and you can permission them to do that and that only. You could have users accessing just S3. You could have another group of users accessing RDS and S3. You know, and it's endless what you can do. IAM allows you to set up very granular permissions. So using IAM users and groups, you can grant different permissions to different people to manage their access to AWS. So you can really define which users can access which services. For example, you could have a bunch of users that can have access to EC2 production instances, but not to development instances. And as you'll see as we go on, you can get very granular. You can set up development teams to have read-write access to volumes, but without administration access, or development teams that can add new storage volumes to development instances, but are not allowed to launch new instances. IAM allows you to securely allocate the credentials that applications running on EC2 instances need so that they can access other AWS resources, for example, S3 buckets or databases. And this diagram here, which we'll go over in a later section, gives you a rough idea. But all you need to know at this stage is that if you have an application that runs on an EC2 instance and the EC2 instance has been configured accordingly in IAM, the application can automatically inherit the permissions it needs to go and access S3 buckets or databases without actually having to store or pass user credentials. IAM allows you to set up identity federation, so you can allow users who already have passwords elsewhere, for example, Facebook, Microsoft Active Directory, or Google, to get temporary access to your AWS account. Now, you've probably used this in applications where when you set up a new account, you have options to log in using Facebook or your Gmail account, and that's basically identity federation. Now, a hot topic these days is identity information or auditing. And IAM allows you to log, monitor, and track what users are doing with your AWS resources through the use of CloudTrail. Now, there's a whole section on CloudTrail later in this course. Here's a brief overview for you. It logs everything, user time they're logged in, IP addresses, and it will write it to a log and store it in an S3 bucket where you can have full administration control and you can keep all the log files there for, well, for as long as you want or until the auditors come knocking. Now IAM is PCI DSS compliant, which means it is payment card industry and data security standard compliant. In other words, it can process, store, and trans transmit credit card data from a merchant or service provider. IAM has multi-factor authentication built in, so you can configure two-factor authorization for users and resources to ensure absolute security using MFA devices, or well, these days it's easier and simpler to use MFA applications on your mobile phone, such as Google Authenticator. 
So I'm sure you've all been in here and done this where you have to log into a website and then you're asked to enter your six digit PIN and you look at your device and type it in. Well, that's what multi-factor authentication is. And finally, password policy. IAM allows you to define password strength and rotation policies and also the number of characters and special characters, etc. So you can really lock down your passwords accessing AWS. So what are IAM policies? Well, a policy is a document that defines one or more permissions, and policies can be attached to users, groups, and roles. They're written in something called JavaScript Object Notation, or JSON for short, and we're going to look at an example of this in a few slides' time. And there are a number of policies that AWS has predefined, which you can select from, or you can create and edit your own. So as I mentioned, AWS has many predefined policies which allow you to define granular access to AWS resources. And here's a screenshot of the policy page where you can see there's around 200 policies that are available for use at the moment. So let's take a look at a couple of them so you can get more of an idea of what a policy is. One of the most commonly used policies is administrator access policy. And this provides full access to AWS services and resources. So it's kind of the administrator slash root user. So here's your admin user. And here is a screenshot of the Amazon Web Services console with all the services available. So if you have the admin user administrator access policy, you can do whatever you want. You can go in and access absolutely everything. So you would only be giving this to a select few people. Another popular policy is Amazon EC2 full access policy. Now this provides full access to Amazon EC2 and the associated resources, which are Elastic Load Balancer, CloudWatch, and Auto Scaling. So if your users have this, they can do what they want with EC2, but they have no access to any other services. Amazon S3 read only access policy. Uh, this policy provides read-only access to all buckets via the AWS Management Console. So here's your users, you've given them this policy. They have read-only permissions on S3, but they have no other permissions on any other services. So as you can see, you can get very granular with your policy creation. As I mentioned earlier, AWS policies are written in something called JSON, or JavaScript Object Notation which stores data in easily readable key value pairs. Now here's an example of an AWS policy written in JSON. And as you can see, it's not that complicated. So let's break this down. So at the top, there are some policy wide information that helps you identify details about the policy. In this case, it's the version, but you could put whatever you want here. Then there's the statement section, kind of the meat of the JSON policy. And this is where the policy rules are written. In this example, there are three entries. There's the effect, which is the effect the user has when they request access, which is either allow or deny in this case. The default is that resources are denied to users, so you typically specify that you will allow users access rather than vice versa. Then there's the action, and this is the action that you will allow. So each AWS service has its own set of actions, and in this example, we're allowing S3 list bucket access and any actions that you don't explicitly allow are denied. So users will be able to list the contents of the bucket, but they won't be able to do anything else. And finally, there's the resource. And this is the resources that you're allowing the action to take place on. In this example, we're allowing list bucket access on the example bucket. And users with this policy won't be able to access any other buckets. Welcome to the IAM policy creation demo. In this demo, I want to create a new policy that allows read-only access to an Amazon S3 bucket called Simply Learn. So to do this, I'm going to go to the Security and Identity section and click on Identity and Access Management. On the next page, I'm going to click on Policies on the left-hand side. And here we have a list of all the Amazon predefined policies. As you can see, there's quite a few. And you can tell they're Amazon predefined because they have this little Amazon box logo next to them. 
So we want to create a new policy and we're presented with three different options. The first of which is copy an AWS managed policy. So we can start with an AWS policy and customize it to fit our needs. Secondly, there's the policy generator where we can select services and actions from a list and the policy generator will create a policy for us. Or you can create your own policy using the policy editor and editing JSON code manually. Now we're going to select the first option because this is easiest for what we need to do. So we'll click on select and we're presented with a list of policies. Now we want an S3 policy. So if we type S3 into the search, we can see there's two options, S3 full access and S3 read only access. So we want the latter. We'll click select and here's our policy. So as you can see, it's given a predetermined policy name and which is Amazon S3 read only access and it's put the date in here. So we want to remove that and we want to give it a more meaningful name. So we'll call it simply learn S3 read only access. As a description saying what it is. So we want to provide read only access to simply learn buckets via the AWS management console. Then we get to the policy document, which is written in JSON. So as you can see, we have the version, which we won't need to change. And then we have the statement and the effect is allow. So we're allowing the action and the action is S3 get and S3 list. And there's the resource. At the minute it says asterisk, which means all S3 buckets. So we need to change this. So I'll cut and paste in this code that I copied from the Amazon website which is basically saying AWS S3 and then the name of the bucket we're giving access to. So we'll change this to simply learn and we're giving read access to all files in the simply learn bucket. Now on the bottom, there's a button called validate policy. So we can see whether my code is correct. So we click on that and it says this policy is valid. So yes, the code is fine. So now we're okay to click create policy. And there at the top, it says simply learn S3 read only access has been created. Now you are ready to attach your policy to users, groups and roles. So let's look for it in our policy list. So we'll type in S3 and there we are. Simply learn S3 read only access. And you can tell that it's a user defined policy because there's no Amazon box next to the name. So there we are. Now we're ready to use our S3 read only policy, which we will look use in following lessons. Welcome to the IAM users, groups and roles section. In this section, we're going to take a look at what IAM users, groups and roles are used for. And then we'll have a demonstration on how to create each of them in the AWS management console. So what are IAM users? Well, users are defined as the people or systems that use your AWS resources. They can be administrators who need to access the AWS console and manage your resources, or they can be end users like developers or production support who need to access AWS content, or they can even be systems that need permissions to access your AWS data. So AWS provides a number of different ways to provide secure access to your AWS resources, and we're going to look at them here. So the first one is an email address and password. And this is created when you first sign up to use AWS and it allows you access to the AWS management console, discussion forums and support center. Now this shouldn't be shared with anyone else as it's effectively the root account for your AWS resources. The next option, which we're discussing in this lecture is the I am username and password. And this allows multiple individuals or applications access to your AWS account. Each user can use his or her own usernames and passwords to sign in to the AWS Management Console and discussion forums and support center. Next is multi-factor authentication or MFA for short and AWS MFA enabled. When you sign into an AWS website, you're prompted for your username and password as well as an authentication code from your MFA device. These multiple factors provide increased security for your AWS account settings and resources. Now access keys. 
they come as an access key ID and a secret access key. And these are provided to you whenever you set up a new IAM user. You use access keys to sign programmatic requests that you make to AWS, whether you're using the AWS SDK, REST or Query APIs. What this basically means is that developers don't need to store or pass credentials to AWS resources. This is all done behind the scenes for you by AWS. And here is an example of an access key ID and a secret access key. And we'll look at this further in the demo that follows this lesson. And finally, there are key pairs. Now key pairs consist of a private and public key and are used only for Amazon EC2 and Amazon Cloud Run. You use the private key to create a digital signature, which AWS validates against the corresponding public key. So that's just an extra layer of security. So before we go to the demo, I'd like to ask you, which of these options would you choose? Would you rather have your users logging straight into Amazon Web Services, all using the same administration accounts? Or would you rather users log in with their own individual accounts using IAM? Well, obviously it's the latter. You want to create individual accounts for each user that accesses your AWS resources. So you can tighten down exactly what security they use. You can have auditing capabilities so you know who's doing what and when. And it will simplify the management of your uh, systems because if you're all using the same user, when you change the password, you have to tell everyone. But if everyone's using their own individual user accounts, let's see the steps to create an IAM user. So in this demonstration, we're going to create a new user and create their password so that someone can log into the AWS console without having to use a shared account. So to do this, we'll start in the security and identity section and click on I am. And we will move to the left hand side and click on users. And you can see that currently there's only one user in here and that's me, but we want to create a new user. So let's click on create new users. And you can enter some usernames to create. Now we're going to create a new user called simply learn user which is going to be our basic read-only Simply Learn account. And there's an option here to generate an access key for each user. These are not used in the username password type scenario. Instead, they're used to allow access to AWS via external tools such as command line interface. And we'll cover in that more in the EC2 section. Now you only get to see these credentials once, so you need to download them. So we'll click on create user. Now it tells me that my user has been created successfully and also that this is the last time these user security credentials will be available for download. So if I click on show user credentials, there I can see my simply learn access key ID and secret access key ID. Now you don't need to know these, you just need to save them down into a safe place so that you can use them to access other resources. So if I click on download credentials in the bottom right and it will create a credentials CSV file. Now when I click close that's the last time I'll see those. Okay so there's my new user, simply learn user. Now at the moment if someone was had this account and they wanted to log into the console they couldn't because we haven't set a password. So that's the next thing we're going to do. So we click on user actions and manage password. And we have two options. We can either assign an auto-generated password or we can assign a custom password if we wanted to type something in. But whichever you choose, it's always a good idea to require the user to change their password the next time they log in. Now we're gonna use an assign an auto-generated password and we'll click on apply. And it tells me that my password has been created. And again, this is the last time these credentials will be available. So we can show them and there's the password. And we can also click download to push them into another CSV file for safekeeping. So we'll click on close. And now we can see that my user has been created and there's a tick against the password. And we can also see that it's never been used because obviously I've just set this up. So what else can we do? Well, let's click on the user. Now we're under the security credentials tab. Now, if the user forgot their password at any point in time, we could click on manage password and with various options of how we can reset their password for them. 
Also, we can see here, here are the access keys for that user. And if we manage to lose the keys or we wanted to replace them, we can click create access key here and we'll generate some new ones, but we're not gonna do that now. The last thing I'd like to show you here is the multi-factor authentication device. And it's currently set to no. Now for administration accounts, it's always a good idea to set up MFA access. And we could do that by clicking manage MFA device. And then you would choose a virtual MFA device or a hardware MFA device. Now these days, most people would you have a, a software device on their mobile phone. If you're as old as I am, then you probably used to use like a hardware token that you had to carry around with you on your keychain. So we'll select a virtual MFA device. And then it says to activate a virtual MFA device, you must first install an AWS MFA compatible application on your smartphone, PC or other device. Now I have Google Authenticate on my phone. And then what it does is it gives you a QR code and you use your mobile phone, the Google Authenticate application to scan the QR code so that you can, it will generate some numbers. So I'm just going to do that now. And I've just scanned that on my mobile phone. So now it's going to give me some numbers to type in. So if I type in and here's the new one and I click on activate virtual MFA and there we are. My MFA device was successfully associated with this device. So now every time I want to log in as the Simply Learn user, I'll also be requested to type in my security code from Google Authenticator. And that concludes the I am user creation demonstration. Now, an IAM group is defined by Amazon as a collection of users that all inherit the same set of permissions. So that's pretty standard user security terminology. So let's take a look at a scenario. Imagine you are the security administrator for your company. So whenever a new user joins your company, you need to give them the permissions they require so they can do their job properly. If you're granting permissions to users, that means Every time a new developer joins, you have to log in and give their user the development permissions. Then when an administrator joins, you have to give them the administrator permissions and so on. Now, obviously this is a time consuming and inefficient way of doing things. And that's where groups come in. By granting permissions at the group level means you only have to set the permissions once. So you as the admin user, can create a group called developers and give it the appropriate permissions. And you can create a group called admins and give it the administrator permissions. Then when new people join, it's just a case of adding their user into the appropriate group. Let's see the steps to create an IAM group. So in this demonstration, we're going to create an IAM group so that we don't have to grant permissions to users individually. So let's start. Again, security and identity, identity and access management section. And we will move to the left hand side and this time we're going to click on groups. OK, so at the minute we can see there's one group in my account and that's administrators. So I click on that. We can see that it just has me in there. So what we want to do is create a read only group for our Simply Learn user. So we go to create new group. We give the group a name which we're going to call simply learn underscore read only. So this is a restricted user group that only has read only access. So click on next step on the bottom right. And now we get to attach a policy to our group. Now, if you remember a few lectures back, we created the simply learn read only access policy, and we're going to attach that policy to our simply learn read only group. So we tick on the box and we click next step. And then we get to review. So it's we get to review the name we've chosen and the policy we've applied. So we're happy with that. So we'll click on create group. And there we are. Now we can see there is our new simply learn underscore read only group. Now at the minute it has no users attached to it. So if we tick the box next to simply learn read only, 
go to group actions and we want to add users to the group so there's two users available me or simply learn user so let's click on simply learn user and click add users and there we are now we can see that there's one user in the group if we click on this we can see that the simply learn user is in this group if we look at the permissions and we can see that there's one policy attached to this group and it's the simply learn s3 read only access policy so now whenever a new person starts in the organization and they require this permission we just simply add them to the group and that concludes the IAM group creation demonstration so what are IAM roles well an IAM role is similar to a user it's basically an AWS identity with permission policies that determine what the identity can and cannot do However, the difference between a role and a user is that there is no password or access key associated with it. And it can be assumed by anyone who needs to use it. So how do roles work? Well, roles can be used to delegate access to users, applications or services that are not typically able to access your AWS resources. So if you look at the diagram here, this is an example of a mobile app that wants permission to use AWS, but doesn't actually store AWS keys in the app itself. So we cover this in more detail in the EC2 section, but the brief overview here is that step one is that the administrator creates a role that gives read access to the photos bucket. Then you launch an instance with this role. So that means that any application or user that accesses or uses or runs on this instance will automatically inherit the permissions of the role. So when the application runs, it retrieves the role credentials from the instance, which means it can access the photos bucket. And then the application performs the action it requires, which is getting photos from the bucket. Let's see the steps to create an IAM role. Okay, in this final demo for IAM, we're going to create a role. So as we've seen, we've created users and policies and groups that allow people to have access to our S3 Simply Learn bucket. Now, say we had an application that needed to run on an EC2 instance and also needed read-only access to this bucket. Well, we can create a role and allocate that to the EC2 instance so that it has permissions automatically. So to do that, we'll go to Security and Identity and the IAM option Back over to the left hand side where I'm sure you're now getting very familiar with and we'll click on roles. As you can see there's a few roles in here already for various things but we want to create a new role. So we're going to call this simply learn s3 read only and that's going to be our role. So we click on next step. Now as you can see there's various options here. There's the AWS service role, which allows resources to call AWS services on your behalf. You have the role for cross account access, so you can provide access between AWS accounts you own or AWS accounts from other companies or organizations. And there's also a role for identity provider access. So here you can set up your federated access or your single sign on using SAML. Now, in this example, we want to keep it simple. We want to create an Amazon EC2 instance that has read-only access to our S3 bucket. So we click on select and here's the policy page. Now we want to select our Simply Learn S3 read-only access. So we select the policy, we click on next step. We get to review, so we have the role name, we have the trusted entity which is EC2 and we have our policy which is the simply learn s3 read only access so we click on create role and there is the new role created so if we click on that we can just have a look and we can verify that it has the s3 read only policy and trusted identities are amazon ec2 now when we get to the ec2 section of this course we can launch an ec2 instance with this role and it would automatically inherit the details and the rules of this particular policy.
So this is IAM best practices and this is the final lesson in the IAM section and we'll give an overview of the AWS recommended best practices for using IAM. Firstly, you should always create individual IAM users. This means that everyone in your organization will have unique credentials and you can control their permissions at an individual level. It's also much easier to make users rotate their credentials when you're not using shared accounts. We all know how complicated and difficult it can be to try and change passwords on shared accounts, i.e. impossible. And if you're using individual users, it's much easier to identify security breaches because then you can do a forensic investigation and you can pinpoint exactly where the problem came from. With shared accounts, that's probably not going to happen. When you create IAM policies, make sure that you grant least privilege. In other words, only grant the permissions that users require to perform only the task they have to do. Although it's much easier to grant elevated credentials from the start, it's not good practice, and it's much more secure to start with minimum permissions required and grant additional access as required. Trust me when I say it's easier to grant permissions to a user than trying to revoke them. The goal of IAM is really to protect your assets first, rather than to make your life easier. So you really should grant only what users actually need. You should always manage permissions with groups. For the main reason, it will minimize your workload drastically, as it's easier to assign a permission to a group than to assign it to many individual users. As one change to a group will update the permissions for multiple users. It's also simpler to reassign permissions if a user has a change in responsibilities. For example, if a developer moves to the admin team, you just have to move the user account from the developer group to the admin group and your work is complete. The alternative would be to have to completely reassign the permissions for each individual user. And using groups means it's also easier to keep track of your security configuration. If an auditor comes to you and says, let me know all the people that have administration access to a particular EC2 instance, if you're in groups, you just say, hey, here's the list of users. If you're not using groups, that means you have to go through each individual user to find out what they're doing. Where possible, it's always a good idea to add additional access control to ensure that your resources are fully protected. Examples of this are adding further conditions like the use of MFA to log in, or specifying that access to certain resources can only come from a particular IP address. A good example of this would be allowing RDP access to a production server. You could insist that to log in with an account that has this permission, the user first needs to connect using MFA, and then once logged in, you can specify that they can only RDP from a server with a particular range of IP addresses. This means that anyone that fails this security check won't be able to RDP in. There are several features available in AWS that you can use to log user actions. The log files show the time and date of actions, the source IP for an action, and which actions failed due to inadequate permissions, and many, many more. The best monitoring tool for IAM is CloudTrail, which we talked about briefly earlier, which logs AWS API calls and related events made on or behalf of an AWS account. And here's that diagram again, and you can see that user activity is written to a log and stored in an S3 bucket for use in the future. It's an obvious one, but obviously very important. You need to ensure that your users require strong passwords and that they rotate their passwords periodically. As you can see in a screenshot here, this is the I am password policy page and using it, you can define a suitable password policy to set requirements such as minimum length, whether it requires non-alphanumeric characters and how frequently they must be rotated and many more. Applications that run on Amazon EC2 instances need credentials so that they can interact with other AWS products and services. Now we've seen this diagram before, but rather than making your developers pass credentials to Amazon EC2, you can use IAM roles so that temporary credentials are dynamically passed to EC2. This means that there's no need to share security credentials and no need to store long-term credentials. IAM will also automatically rotate these credentials for you. So as in this diagram suggests, when you launch new EC2 instances, you can specify an IAM role for the instance. Then any applications that run on this particular EC2 instance will automatically inherit the role's credentials when they access AWS. 
You should also reduce or remove unnecessary credentials. You shouldn't use the root account unless absolutely necessary, and instead you should create accounts that only have the access required. Also, you can run a credential report to remove IAM credentials that aren't needed. So if you run a report and you can see that particular passwords and access keys have not been used in a long time, you can remove them to tighten up your security. This is the practice assignment for configuring IAM access, where you'll use IAM to configure user access to AWS. As the admin for your company's AWS account, you need to assign permissions to four new users. Two users require full access to EC2. One user requires administration access to all AWS resources. And one user requires read-only access to S3. Use AWS best practices when configuring the user access, so be sure to make use of groups. You can now log into your AWS console and practice the given scenario which should ideally take you around 10 to 15 minutes to complete. Welcome to the key takeaway section. AWS Identity and Access Management allows you to securely control access to your AWS services and resources for your users. Policies, which are written in JSON, allow you to define granular access to AWS resources. Users, are defined as the people or systems that use your AWS resources, like administrators or end users or systems that need permissions to access your AWS data. Groups are a collection of users that all inherit the same set of permissions and can be used to reduce your user management overhead. IAM roles are similar to users, but they can be assumed by anyone who needs them and a role does not have a password or access key associated with it. Roles are used to delegate access to users, applications, or services. AWS also has a list of IAM best practices to ensure that your environment is secure and safe. This concludes the Identity and Access Management lesson. The next lesson is Virtual Private Cloud. Hey there, let us now talk about the third lesson of the AWS Solutions Architect course. We all know that security is a critical part of any IT infrastructure, and a key part of a solutions architect role is to ensure that all resources residing on the AWS cloud are securely protected. You need to ensure that resources can only be reached by the end users or applications that should be accessing them. For this, you have to design and control the security access to AWS so that end users and applications do not have more permissions than they need. Along with this, you have to enforce strict password policies to make sure there are no weak points of entry into your cloud environment. Fortunately, AWS makes it easy to do all of this and more. How? Through the AWS Identity Access Management Service that enables you to securely control access to AWS services and resources for your users. This lesson will cover all the features available within the AWS Identity and Access Management Service. So let's begin. By the end of this lesson, you will be able to describe the key features of IAM and how they can simplify and secure user access to AWS. Use the AWS policies to define permissions to AWS users. Explain the steps to create users in AWS. Describe how groups simplify IAM management. Use roles to delegate access to the AWS resources. List the best practices for IAM.